Today we are uh, in week five of our series, 40 Days with Jesus, and the premise is very simple. What would it be like if we hung out with Jesus 40 days in a row, if we engaged with the Bible, if we attended small groups and talked about all of that? It's all about the book of John, and so today we're going to talk from John chapter 13, verse 1 through 17, and today we're going to talk about serving like Jesus. How many know that when we follow Jesus, he begins to change us? I don't have to change before I follow Jesus. I just start following Jesus, and he changes me. Remember, he said, I will make you to become fishers of men. You shall be Peter, right? And so God is changing us, and so as we, as we follow him, he begins to change us. And one of the ways that he begins to change us is we begin to think like a servant, that's good. and that's the, that's the story we want to read here today. Let's begin here in John chapter 13, not 1 John, but John 13, verse 1. There are not 13 chapters in 1 John, by the way. That's a test. <laughs> it was just before the Passover festival. Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to leave, his, leave this world and go to the Father. So having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. Let me just pause for a second and say, loving like Jesus means loving all the way till the end. Don't give up. Somebody needs to hear this today. Do not give up. If we're going to be like Jesus, we love him all the way to the end. That was totally free. All right. Um, the evening meal was in progress, and the devil had already prompted Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power and that he had come from God and was returning to God. So he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, and wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin, and he began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. And when he had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and returned to his place. Do you understand what I've done for you? He asked them, you call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that's, that's what I am. But now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, watch this, you also should wash one another's feet. I have set you as an example. He says, so this is something that you should be doing, that you should do as I have done for you. Very truly, I tell you, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. You also ought to wash one another's uh, feet. Now, here's, here's the deal. Uh, this takes place on the night that Jesus is about to be betrayed. So he is moments away from being arrested and being taken before Pilate. The next day, he's going to be crucified. And so here they are in this upper room, and they are uh, they're having the Last Supper together. And so something interesting happens because it was the custom of the day that when they would have a meal, that there would be somebody there to wash the feet of everybody. And so in those days, remember that they didn't have uh, nice shoes or closed shoes, and they certainly didn't have Uber. So they were walking on dirty roads, dirty paths, that was shared by animals. So can you imagine, how many know most of us don't have pretty feet, right? Most of us, raise your hand if you have, don't raise your hand. Raise your foot if you have ugly, don't raise your foot. But feet just aren't pretty. Feet are smelly, feet are stinky. Imagine that with all of the crud from first century Jerusalem, Israel at that time. Well, so it would be the custom of somebody to wash the feet of everybody before you ate. But on this night, in this gathering, nobody had arranged for somebody to do that. There was no hired hand to clean their feet. And because, uh, because they were good Jewish people, they couldn't eat the meal without washing their feet. Now, can't you just see the disciples looking around at each other quietly when they realize, hey, no one's here to wash the feet of everybody else? You know, and they're probably thinking in their mind, I'm not going to do it. He's not going to do it. I'm not going to do I'm not going to do that. That stinks. So Jesus, in one of his, another brilliant move that Jesus has, he 
take, the Bible says he takes off his outer clothes. He grabs a towel, wraps it around his waist. He grabs a water basin. And then one by one, he kneels down in front of these men that he had spent the last three years with, and he washes their feet. Imagine it was pretty quiet in the room at that moment. And uh, they were probably a little bit uncomfortable, like, why is he doing this? I want you to realize, the king became a servant. The one who made them was serving them. Now, I'm guessing that was probably the longest 30 minutes of their life. It was probably difficult for them to be on the receiving end of this, and there's probably lots of uncomfortable shifting around and nervousness and maybe even some tears. And uh, when the task is completed, Jesus gives this command in John 13, you also ought to wash one another's feet. So, Pastor, are you saying uh, 40 days with Jesus, I follow Jesus, and I've got to start washing other people's feet? What kind of church is this anyway? I thought about uh, setting out water basins all across the front just to kind of scare you a little bit. You're welcome. I didn't do that. Now, I grew up in a church, uh, a general Baptist church. That's the opposite of a specific Baptist church. You get what you pay for. That's all I got to say. I grew up in a general Baptist church where we had a foot washing service once a month on a Sunday night. Wow, I was right. It was the lowest attended service every month. <laughs> Nobody... Nobody wanted to be part of that foot washing service. So, Pastor, does, are you saying that Jesus, when he said we, also, we should wash one another's feet, is he saying that we should actually have foot washing services? I think the context tells us that that's not what he was trying to teach us. What he was trying to teach us is that we should serve one another. He says, I'm an example. What I'm doing right now is I'm setting an example for all of you, that if you want to follow me, if you want to be like me, you've got to learn to serve other people. Matthew 20, verse 26 and 28, this is from the Living Bible. Anyone wanting to be a leader among you must be your servant. And if you want to be right at the top, you got to serve like a slave. I think that's offensive to people in our culture our selfie, selfish, self-righteous culture, Jesus says, listen, following me means serving. Becoming like me means becoming a servant. So if we're followers of Jesus, we're called to become like Jesus by serving other people. Let me put it to you as simply as I know how. Saved people serve people. Can I say that again? Saved people serve people people. Followers of Jesus serve. And so in our journey of becoming like Jesus, we're called to take on the attitude of a servant. Now, the question is, why? What's up with that? Well, first of all, it's because Jesus said so, right? And he's Lord, and we're not. So we should do what he says. But everything that Jesus asks us to do is for our benefit. He's not trying to hurt us. He's not trying to harm us. He's trying to show us the way to life. So let me give you a few reasons why serving is such a great thing, because serving is the way in. (coughs) Serving is the way in. Let me show you what I mean by that. Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and that he had come from God and was going to God. I want you to notice that that John makes a point that Jesus was very secure (coughs) <coughs> in, in who he was. He says, I'm God's son. He knew where he had come from. He knew where he was going. And how many know that gave him the wherewithal to serve? I'm trying to tell you that it's difficult to serve people when you're insecure about yourself. See, when I, when I begin to follow Jesus, he helps me see myself for the way I should be in the eyes of God. In the eyes of God, I'm nobody's slave. I'm God's son. But because I know who I am, a son or daughter of God, that frees me to serve other people. Come on, somebody. You're going to get this in a minute. Because some people serve other people out of guilt. 
or condemnation or out of insecurity. But Jesus is saying, <coughs> excuse me, that the more I know who I am in Jesus, the more I am free to serve other people. You realize that people aren't trying to trick you. People aren't trying to bait and switch you. You understand that, hey, it's my joy to serve Jesus because Jesus serves me. That's pretty awesome stuff. I think a great example of this is Mother Teresa. Mother Teresa uh, was a poor Roman Catholic nun. She was famous, not because she was rich, not because uh, she had a lot of titles. She was famous, why? Because she served. And the primary way that she served people was through operating a home for people who were dying in Calcutta, India. These were the poorest of the poor. Doctors couldn't heal them. She couldn't heal them. But she invited them into her home, the mission of mercy, and she would give them dignity and care for them before they died, as they died. She served the least influential people in the world. But it gave her such moral credibility that she could walk into the halls of Congress and everyone would listen to what she had to say. She won the Nobel Prize and the Catholic Church canonized her as a saint. How did that happen? Because she served. Can I, I'm going to stop right here and just encourage everybody, if you want to have influence on the people around you, learn to serve them. If you want to truly make a difference in other people's life, we've got to take on the attitude of Jesus and serve other people. And I think it's perfect. Uh, this is a perfect message for Mother's Day because on Mother's Day, we celebrate the influence that God has given to moms. There's a reason that somebody said the hand that rocks the cradle is the hand that rules the world. And I just want to take a moment and encourage any lady here who feels less than valued or less than important. Maybe you're a stay-at-home mom. Maybe, you know, you're, you're struggling with that. But I want to challenge you to never underestimate the value that you are giving to your family, to your kids, to your spouse, to your community, simply by serving. One more time, guys. Come on, give it up for every, every mom, every lady. So serving is the way in. And secondly, serving is the way up. Serving is the way up. So in Luke's version of this story of what happened on this night when Jesus washed their feet, Luke dives a little bit deeper into the conversation that was going on before Jesus picked up the towel in the water. They were actually having a conversation about who was the greatest in the room. Can you imagine Peter's version of the story? Hey guys, remember I walked on water. I can rem and I can imagine Matthew saying, yeah, but you sank. <laughs> God, people are like that, right? And so that's really what the context of the conversation, who's the most important, who's the most significant? And Jesus turns everything upside down by washing their feet. And he says this way in Matthew 23, the greatest among you will be your servant, but whoever exalts himself will be humbled. And whoever humbles himself will be exalted. Listen, if you want to be great in the kingdom, Jesus says, serve. If you want to be remembered for the rest of your life, for good things, serve. If you want to be great, you got to serve. And again, this is so countercultural, so opposite of what our culture teaches us. And this is why, and, and let, me, let me press you a little bit, let me challenge you a little bit, the true test of spiritual maturity is your heart to serve. How do I know I'm growing up as a Christian? How do I know I'm becoming mature as a believer? People don't have to beg me to serve. People don't have to guilt me into serving. I get to serve. I don't have to serve. I get to help people. I get to be a blessing. I get to take care of others. This is good preaching. I'm preaching better than your amen. So the idea is that serving is the way up. And on this Mother's Day, I'd like to take a moment and celebrate the greatest servant that this church has ever known. Uh, last week marked 24 years that Tracy and I have been the pastors of this church. And can, I'd like to take a moment and celebrate uh, Tracy as the greatest servant this church has ever seen. Hold on, hold on a second, hold on a second. You're gonna have a moment to do that. 
because most of you don't know that uh, she has used her talent to lead choirs and singing Christmas tree productions and Easter outreaches and honor our hero celebrations and special events. But you also don't know she's painted rooms and toilet stalls and demoed bathrooms and torn up carpet and cleaned toilets and uh, sang on the worship team and led our church's small group ministry, hosted a small group in our home num- innumerable times. She's led our women's ministry. She's organized ladies' Christmas banquets. She's made meal for people in the hospital. She's visited people in the hospital with me. She's visited people in the hospital on her own. She's coached junior Bible quiz teams and traveled all over the country with them. She's attended countless weddings and funerals and baby showers and wedding showers and graduations and open houses. And for 24 years, she has served. And instead of pursuing a career with her degree from Butler, she served me. She served our family. She served this church. And for many, many years, she spent time at home with our boys, raising up two men who love Jesus to this day. She prays for you. She prays for me. She makes me a better pastor. She makes me a better communicator. Would you help me honor the greatest servant this church has ever known? My wife, Tracy. Now, the other thing I failed to mention about Tracy is that she hates to be in front of people (laughs) and hates to have that kind of attention. But uh, how many know today she deserves it? Listen, we think that the way up is by winning a competition with everybody else. But Jesus says the way up is serving. Let's keep going. Lastly, serving is the way in. Serving is the way up. But serving is also the way through. Now, let me explain this to you because there's some pretty interesting dynamics going on in that room, uh, in in the upper room when Jesus washed their feet. See, John says the devil had already put it into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him. So when Jesus was taking that bowl of water and that towel, and one by one, he was washing the feet of his disciples, at some point, he knelt down in front of Judas. And he washed the feet that would just moments later walk away and sell him out and betray him. That's pretty amazing. And John throws in this interesting caveat when he says that the devil had already entered into Judas's heart when Jesus washed his feet. I wonder, I don't, I, I don't think we can explain this theologically, but I wonder if Jesus, when he knelt down to wash Judas' feet and he looked up into Judas' eyes, if he saw the devil himself. And Jesus chose to wash the feet of Judas. Wow. What was he doing there? Well, Jesus was practicing his own preaching when he said, love your enemies. Do good to those who treat you badly. Bless those who curse you and pray for those who are unkind to you. Jesus was clearly demonstrating that when I serve other people, in particular serving people who have hurt me and people who have betrayed me, it's a way through. That I don't have to get stuck in my unforgiveness, in my hurt, and in my pain. I don't have to get stuck in bitterness, in this quagmire, this quicksand of of junk in my heart. See, the Bible says I don't overcome evil with evil. I overcome evil with good. And I want you to remember that Jesus said to Peter, he said, hey, you don't understand what I'm doing right now, but a little bit later, you're going to understand. Imagine after the resurrection and after they're talking and they're recounting the events of what happened on this night that Jesus washed their feet, it would have dawned on them, hey, Judas was there. Jesus washed the feet of Judas as well. Can I ask you a question? Who's your Judas? Who 
Who's the person that hurt you? Who's the person that betrayed you? Who's the person that you think about in moments like this? How in the world do I wash the feet? How in the world do I wash the feet of those who have betrayed or wounded me? This is not going to be easy to hear, but it's the truth. We do what Jesus did. We serve them. That's crazy. No, what I want to do is bash them in the head. What I want to do is pray that a, ca- a thousand camel fleas will infest their armpits. What I want to do is pray that they will lose the elasticity in their underwear forever. I'm talking real pain. You know what I'm saying? But that is not the heart of Jesus. And listen, the only way this happens is if I'm close to Jesus. And he's rubbing off on me. And he's changing me. And he's changing my heart. Okay, pastor, how in the world do I pray? How in the world do I serve my Judas? It might be as simple as praying for them. How many know when you pray for somebody, you're serving them? I love small groups. Uh, I'm leading two small groups during 40 days with Jesus. You know what that means? I've got more people praying for me right now than at any other time. Because one of the things that we do in small groups is we serve each other by praying for each other. Does that make sense to you? And so how do I serve Judas? I pray for them. I ask God to bless them. Maybe God will speak to you today about an act of kindness or some sort of act of mercy that you can show to somebody that you currently don't like right now. Maybe uh, you take your pain from the past and you turn it into your purpose by serving other people who have also experienced the same pain that you have. That's how serving is the way through. Perhaps those of us that have experienced personal loss, and we've all experienced a lot of loss in the past year, maybe we turn that around and we use the pain of that loss to be an encouragement to somebody else who's walking through the valley at this moment. In just a few minutes, we're going to receive an offering for angel care, uh, a kingdom builder offering. And so we want today, our goal is to install an elevator into this home that is being built to house uh, young ladies in crisis pregnancy situations. And so we want to come alongside and put an arm around them and their babies. And we want to be pro-life, not just every four years, but every day of the year, yeah. right? And listen, you say, Pastor, why would I do that? Maybe some of you can take the loss that you've experienced and use that and say, in honor of or in memory of, I'm going to make a gift today. I'm going to be a blessing. My mom passed passed away about a year ago. And so today, Tracy and I are going to give to Angel Care, and we're going to give it in honor of my mom. You say, why, why would we do that? Because I want to take my loss and I want to turn it into something by serving somebody else. Does that make sense to you here today? That's, that's God's heart. And, and let, me just, let me just throw one more thing at you. That serving others is a way out of the valleys of life. If you ever find yourself down and just darkness is surrounding you and, and, and it feels like everything is just closing in you, maybe, just maybe, instead of focusing on yourself, what if you focus on other people? What if you focus on somebody else's need? How many know the, the whole idea of focusing on, on being happy, you're never going to be happy. But if you focus on other people's happiness, many times that happiness comes back to you. I read somewhere that you reap what you sow. All right, before we pray, let me, let me make this real and let's make it very practical. What does serving look like in your family? What does serving look like at work? What does serving look like at church? And what does serving look like in our community? All right, I'm about to give you some family counseling. Are you ready? I'm not even going to charge it. It's totally free. What does it mean to serve your family? Well, the Bible says that the, the origination or the beginning of all quarrels and conflict is selfishness. And again, we live in a culture that says, you know, it's all about you. It's all about me. You got to serve me. You got to meet my needs, right? Well, that's not in the Bible. That's not God's plan for relationship. And so relationships flourish 
when people who love each other serve each other selflessly. Now, let me just pause for a second. If you're here today and your marriage is not what you want it to be, let me challenge you to a contest. All right? The contest is who can outserve the other? That's the best counseling I can ever give you. Try to outserve them, right? Some of you say, Pastor, there's no problem. I do that. No, 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 no. Get rid of that spirit. Because what you're going to find is, as family members, as you begin to figuratively wash their feet, there's a spirit of humility that replaces that quarrelsomeness. There's a spirit of humility that melts away the, the pride and the selfishness. You see how this works? And so we serve our families. What does is, uh, is serving look like at work? What does it mean to wash the feet of the company, of the people I work with or work for or who work for me? I, I, let me just pause for a second and say that a lot of people don't make the connection with following Jesus should affect the way I work. See? <laughs> There's no reaction. Here's what the Bible says. Uh, in Ephesians 6, verse 6, this is from the message. Don't just do what you have to do to get by, but work heartily as Christ's servants, doing what God wants you to do. And work with a smile on your face, always keeping in mind that no matter who happens to be given the orders, you're really serving God. Wherever you work, for whomever you work for, for whomever you work with, wash their feet, Jesus says, by serving them well. Now, if you go to work tomorrow, today, tonight, whatever time you show to work or click in on Zoom, Jesus says, serve them by doing it with all your heart. Because after all, you're not really serving them, you're serving me. I just gave some of you a raise right there. Some of you are about to get a promotion because you're gonna grab onto this. Some of you will be great in your business because this is finally clicking in your heart. You're not there to get a paycheck. Thank God for the paycheck. You're there to serve a purpose. And if you do that with all your heart, good things are going to come your way. I need some people to say amen. All right. And then how does it work at church? What does it mean to wash the feet of the body of Christ? What does it mean to serve at church? Well, let me ask you a few questions. Did anybody greet you when you walked in the door today? Uh, did you enjoy having a sound system so that you could hear what is being uh, sung and what is being said, right? Uh, anybody watching online glad that there's some, uh, that you were able to watch for every, wherever you're watching on your device or your screen or whatever? Uh, for those of you that are parents, did you enjoy the fact that you could take your kids to Grace Kids or to Grace Littles? Can I tell you that happens because somebody is serving they're not being paid. They're volunteering. We call it the dream team around here. And, and that, that's how the body of Christ works. We all serve one another. And 1 Peter 4 says, each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. So the scripture is saying that if you have a gift, it's not for you. If you have a gift... If God gave you a gift, it's not for you. That's right. If God gave you a gift with money, that gift is not for you. Right. If God gave you a gift with music, that gift is not for you. If God gave you the gift of leadership, that gift is not for you. Right. If God gave you the gift of organization, that gift is not for you. That gift is so that you can serve others. Man, I'm preaching good today. Now, here in the American church, we've taken on this mindset of we sit and watch, and we've become consumers of religious goods and services. But that is not what following Jesus is all about. Following Jesus, I don't know why this spirit is on me today. I just feel a spirit of just, feels good right here. I don't know how it feels out there. The idea of church is not for you to come to sit and to soak and to sour. The idea for you as a church is for you to come, we equip you to do what God has called you to do and make a difference in the lives of other people. It's always the people on the front row who believe that, so praise God. All right, let's, let's, 
Let's do this last one. What about our community? What, is it, what does it look like to wash the feet of our community? If you've been going to church here for any length of time, you've heard me say this hundreds of times, but this is our heart. Grace does not exist to go to our community with our hand out. As a church, as a nonprofit organization, we don't walk around to the community, hey, can you donate this? Hey, can you give this? Hey, can you support us? No. Our heart as a church is palms down. How can we bless you? How can we help? How can we, how can we be a blessing to our community? How can we serve uh, you? How can we serve this community? And for years and years and years, that has been our heart. That has been our testimony. And, and let me just go ahead and say, God has opened doors that are amazing. God has given us opportunities that never would have happened except that we chose to serve. We're not here to get something from you. We're here to serve you because that's the heart of Jesus. So how do I serve my community? Well, we're about to take an offering for angel care. That's one way to do it. Our food pantry serves hundreds of people every week. You can serve there and serve our community. Today, our food pantry has a diaper drive uh, to provide diapers for families in need in our community. We don't think about how important that is, but how many know, as a mom or a parent of a young baby, that is a big deal. This summer, uh, summer has always has plenty of opportunities to serve. I want you to mark down this day on Serve Day, July 15th. Serve Day is one day of the year that we ask our entire church to show up for our city, and we're going to serve. Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people, we're going to show up, and we're going to serve this city. We're going to serve the community. You say, Pastor, why would we do that? Because that's the example that Jesus set for us. We wash the feet of our community. We serve them. That's God's heart. You know, I'm, I'm sure on this night that Jesus washed their feet, if they would have had it to do over again, they would have said, you know what, I wish I would have been the one to pick up that towel and to pick up that basin and wash everybody else's feet. You know, here's what, I'm, here's what I'm trying to tell you. When we get to heaven and we look back and we reflect on this life, there's not going to be any regret in heaven. But I think if there's one thing that we're going to say, boy, I wish I would have done more of, I wish I would have served more people. Yeah. Yes. Especially on the day that we get our rewards. Did you know you're going to get rewarded in heaven? The Bible says you're going to get rewarded for every cup of cold water you give in his name. And everyone, the millions and billions and however many people are going to be there on that judgment day and God begins to hand the rewards out, it's probably not going to be to the people we think it's going to be. It's probably not going to be to the Christian pastor on television. It might be. I don't know. It, it may not be that person that has the most charismatic gifts. It's probably going to be that person anonymously but faithfully showed up to the nursery and prayed over those babies and said, Jesus, I pray for this boy. I pray, God, that your hand, come on, somebody. I, I, I believe he's going to call people forward who got up in the middle of the night whenever the Holy Spirit prompted them to intercede and to pray for somebody somewhere, for some pastor, for some missionary, for some family, and you say, God, you can trust me. Wake me up. I'll pray. I believe that the only regret we'll ever have in heaven is I didn't serve enough. I wish I had have served more. That's what Jesus is showing us on this night, is that if you're going to be like me, you serve. Would you bow your head and close your eyes for a second? Would you take a moment and right where you're sit seated today, would you simply ask the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, what are you saying to me today in this message? What is it that I need to do in response to what you are saying today? Father, I pray that you'd help me to have the heart of a servant. I pray that whoever my Judas is, God, would you give me a heart to pray for them, to bless them? Speak to me about what I'm supposed to do. God, I pray that you'd open my eyes to the opportunities around me 
to serve other people. God, would you forgive me for being so self-focused? I don't want to be like that. I want to be like Jesus. Help me to serve my family. Help me to serve where I work. Help me to serve my church. Help me to serve this community. Because God, when my life is over, I want my testimony be to be, I made a difference through Jesus. I made an impact on other people's lives because of Jesus Christ. Father, I pray that that same spirit, that same spirit that Jesus had when he knelt down to wash the feet of his disciples, I ask for that same spirit to come upon me right now. Right now. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. If you're here today and you don't know Jesus personally, maybe you're religious, maybe you know God, maybe you even believe in God, but that's not what Jesus died for. Jesus didn't die so that you could know about him. He died so that you could serve him. He died so that you could follow him. The good news is you can start following Jesus today. You don't have to get your stuff together. You don't have to get your act together. You begin to follow him now, and then he begins to change you. And with God's grace, God's amazing grace, he will do just that. So if you're here today and you say, Pastor, I'm not right with God. If my soul were to be required of me today, I'm not sure if I'd spend eternity in heaven. Can I, can I invite you today to surrender your heart and life to Jesus? If that's you, if the Holy Spirit is speaking to you, tugging on the strings of your heart today, you say, you know what, Pastor, that's me. Would you pray for me? Then I want to lead you in that very first step of your decision to follow Jesus. And I want to pray this prayer, and I'm going to ask you to pray, pray it out loud after me. And I'm going to ask a bunch of people who are going to join with you and pray it out loud as well. But if you're praying this for the first time, for the first time in a long time, Would you pray just a little bit louder than the people around you? What would you pray this way? Dear God, I surrender. My life is yours. From this day forward, I'm following you. I believe that Jesus died for my sin. Please forgive me. I believe that Jesus rose again so that I could have eternal life. Today I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. In Jesus' name, amen. Come on, somebody give God praise for the gospel of Jesus. Amen.